1943, the Supreme Court had a, a second chance to decide a question that it had already considered once before Jackson was on the court. The constitutionality of state laws that compelled school children to salute the flag and say the Pledge of Allegiance every morning or to be expelled from school if they refused and their parents then to become criminally liable for their children's truancy once the children weren't in school. The objectors to these flag salute statutes were Jehovah's Witnesses primarily and they had litigated and lost a claim of conscience and religious freedom that their belief that one should not bow down to graven images included that one should not salute the flag. A defeat in 1940 becomes an ever more controversial topic as the United States is in war against a Nazi power that is built on compulsion and flag salute and Fuhrer salute. And literally the gesture of American flag salute, a hand uh, on the heart and a hand raised towards the flag looks very much like a Nazi salute. In Europe, German witnesses were among the first to go to concentration camps for refusing to perform the Hitler salute. When word of their persecution spread to Minersville, Pennsylvania, in the heart of Pennsylvania coal country, two brave young Jehovah's Witnesses, Billy Gobitis and his sister Lillian, kept their hands at their sides while the other children said the Pledge of Allegiance. The children had the support of their parents, Ruth and Walter Gobitis, grocery store owners who quietly helped their neighbors during the Great Depression. Their family Bible studies taught them to obey only those laws that were consistent with God's teachings. When the school board threatened to send Billy and Lillian to reform school, the Jehovah's Witness families hired a qualified teacher and set up a kingdom school so they could continue their education. Walter Gobitis turned his delivery truck into a makeshift school bus. Soon, kingdom schools began to spring up across the country to accommodate the hundreds of young witnesses who were expelled for putting their religious beliefs into practice. On behalf of his children, Walter Gobitis filed a lawsuit that eventually made its way to the Supreme Court. The Constitution protected free speech and the free exercise of religion, and he would make sure that it was worth the paper it was written on. Lillian was working in the kitchen with her mother when the news came over the radio. They dropped what they were doing and stared in disbelief. The Supreme Court ruled eight to one against Gobitis, the mandatory flag salute was upheld. National unity is the basis of national security, wrote Justice Felix Frankfurter, even at the cost of individual liberty. The only dissent came from the pen of Harlan Fisk Stone. He believed the First Amendment should protect freedom of mind and spirit. But the clouds of war were sweeping across Europe and into the hearts and minds of most Americans. Three weeks later, France fell to the Nazis. Great Britain could be next. No one anticipated the brutal violence that followed the Supreme Court's decision. Jehovah's Witnesses were beaten, lynched, tarred and feathered, and jailed for being un-American. A mob of 2,500 self-styled patriots, including members of the American Legion, ransacked and then torched a kingdom hall in Kennebunk, Maine. Hundreds of cases were documented in 44 states. Some were referred to the Justice Department, then headed by Attorney General Robert Jackson, the nation's chief law enforcement officer. First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt defended the witnesses in her newspaper column. Solicitor General Francis Biddle called the vigilante attacks an outrage. The American Civil Liberties Union and newspaper editorials blasted the Supreme Court decision for promoting bigotry and inciting violence. Many believed a secret network of spies and saboteurs inside the United States called the Fifth Column was laying the groundwork for a German invasion on American soil. Because they refused to serve in the military and salute the flag, Jehovah's Witnesses were prime suspects. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover stoked their fears with a propaganda campaign against the Fifth Column. The communists, the bondsmen, and their allies of totalitarianism are seeking to weaken America's defense. 
These traitors who shout of liberty as they seek to destroy it tell all young people that they should refuse to take up their country's arms. Americanism is on trial. Its real test lies in the ability of red-blooded Americans to meet and to defeat the fifth column of destruction. Jackson's Justice Department was criticized for his lackluster investigation of the violence, but his position was clear. Let us avoid some of the mistakes which give aid and assistance to any fifth column. First, we must permit no tampering with our civil rights, for the first break in that bulwark will provide the opening wedge for those who seek the breakdown of our democratic system. Second, we must prevent lawlessness and mob violence, for by destroying law and order we create the confusion in which the fifth column thrives. The unprecedented outbreak of mob violence shook the court to its core. Some of the justices publicly admitted that they had made a mistake. The Gobitis' case had been wrongly decided. In 1942, a nearly identical flag salute case was making its way through the courts. Two little girls who lived near Charleston, West Virginia, Gaithy Barnett and her sister Marie, were sent home with their cousins from Slip Hill Grade School because they would not join their classmates in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. The West Virginia Board of Education had required that all school children salute the flag. This was a time uh, right after the World War II began. There was great patriotism. And they, West Virginia School Board felt that every child should show this patriotism in the morning. Noncompliance meant parents could face imprisonment or lose custody of their children. When Hayden Covington, a lawyer at the Jehovah's Witness headquarters in New York, got wind of the case, he seized the opportunity to challenge the Gobitis ruling. By the time West Virginia Board of Education versus Barnett reached the Supreme Court, public sentiment towards the witnesses had changed, and so had the court. Harlan Stone, the lone dissenter in the Gobitis case, was Chief Justice now. In deciding another case, Justice Black, Douglas, and Murphy signaled they had changed their positions. And two new appointees, including Justice Jackson, had joined the court. But with the United States now embroiled in World War II and Americanism at an all-time high, the outcome was far from a foregone conclusion. Jackson thought that the, the core values of the First Amendment included this realm of conscience. Free exercise, free speech, free assembly uh, added up to a kind of, of freedom that the school children believers were entitled to, whether the flag uh, was important to the state or not. On Flag Day, June 14th, 1943, the Supreme Court announced its decision to uphold the First Amendment rights of the Jehovah's Witness school children. The vote was six to three. Jackson wrote the majority opinion for the Supreme Court and said that these girls could refuse to salute the flag. They had the right to refuse this. They had religious freedom. They couldn't be forced to say something they didn't believe, and it was wrong to keep them out of school. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. He's writing an anthem about what true patriotism is, voluntary flag salute, voluntary patriotism, at a time when, it, when it's being fought for against people who feel otherwise. Um, so that, that opinion is, is perhaps his greatest uh, because it really understands and fits a, a moment that is both two little girls in West Virginia and a million soldiers on fields of combat. The flag salute case marked a turning point for religious freedom and freedom of speech in the United States. 
The court had the power to protect minorities from what Alexis de Tocqueville, author of Democracy in America, called the tyranny of the majority. I, I believe Jackson was very balanced in how he looked at civil liberties and individual rights. He wrote later in his life that it was a balance between the rights of a person, individual, and how it impacted the rest of the population and the majority. I suppose the American people, on whose eternal vigilance liberty ultimately depends, are well agreed that what they want of the courts is that they both preserve liberty and protect security, finding ways to reconcile the two needs so that we do not lose our heritage defending it.